Um, good evening, everybody. Thanks for coming out on a, on a wet evening to, uh, to hear tonight's lecture. Uh, my name is Carl Hafer, and I'm the director of the Rotman Institute of Philosophy. Um, and it's a pleasure to see you all here and to have our distinguished speaker with us tonight. But before uh, introducing Dr. Lexchin, I'd like um, to invite Emily Tector to come up and, and say a little bit about the lecture series that this event is part of. Emily is the project coordinator for the Situating Science uh, Cluster Project, which she'll explain briefly here. Thank you very much. You can hear me. Yes. Testing one, two, three. Thanks for coming, guys. Um, for the, uh, those who have the gold, make the evident, the pharmaceutical industry and clinical trials. Um, first, a big thanks out to um, Joel Lechton for coming. Uh, he's feeling a little bit under the weather, so we're very honored to have him stick around. And you might pass out with your eyes, but that'll be a spectacle to watch. <laughs> no. Um, our sponsors as well, I wanted to thank the Robert Institute of Philosophy and Situating Science. Uh, we've teamed together for this event. So very quickly, I just want to say I'm Emily Tector. I'm the project coordinator for Situating Science. Um, this is, for those of you who don't know, a national networking uh, and partnership building project funded by the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada. We promote communication, collaboration amongst humanists and social scientists um, in Canada as well as internationally um, that are engaged in the study of, of science and technology. Putting science in social and cultural contexts and connecting folks by workshops, conferences, lecture series. Some of you students may have heard of our um, summer school that we're having this summer as well. Robin has their summer school as well. Um, so we have lots of events that happen annually. We have dozens of videos, publications, podcasts, blogs, and hundreds of events available on our website and YouTube channel, so please check that out at situsci.ca. We are joined by other folks virtually tonight by a live stream across the world, so hello to them. The event marks part five of the Lives of Evidence National Lecture Series, which examines the cultural, ethical, political, and scientific role of evidence in our world. So far, we had philosopher of science Jim Brown, who's here in the audience. Um, who some of you may know, speak on patents, progress, and commercialized medicine. Um, Scott Finley, uh, a biologist at University of Ottawa, uh, from, and also from Evidence for Democracy, um, those protests on Parliament Hill, for instance, you may have heard of, speaking on accountability in the future of Canadian science. Renowned bioethicist Carl Elliott, who calls Joel the godfather of bioethics. <laughs> Carl Elliott, speak on psychiatric research abuse, and before that, Cindy Patton on inventing the crystal meth HIV connection. All of these, as part of our lecture series, um, are in the process of being uploaded if they're not already on our YouTube channel. After Joel, um, actually tonight, uh, uh, Rotman uh, Canada Research Chair uh, Stathis Silos was speaking tonight in, in uh, Ottawa, um, but he'll also be speaking um, April 16th, so you can catch him online uh, speaking. Uh, from the University of Toronto on the war on science, the war on science trend. And that's April 16th. So um, without further ado, I'm going to present Carl Hopper, who will, who will quickly introduce our speaker tonight. Just be sure to talk into the mic. Thanks very much, Emily. Can you hear me back there? Okay. Um, so I just want to say a few words about uh, tonight's speaker. Um, Joel Lexchin received his MD from the University of Toronto in 1977, and he's currently a professor at the School of Health Policy and Management uh, and the Faculty of Health at UT. He's also a staff physician at the University Health Network, the Department of Emergency Medicine, where he's been practicing emergency medicine since 1988. Dr. Lexchin's areas of research include pharmaceutical policy, globalization and health, and neoliberalism and health. He's been writing and publishing about tonight's topic, pharmaceutical policy, for the past 30 years. He's the author or co-author of over 140 peer-reviewed papers on a wide variety of topics in this area, including drug regulation, pharmacosurveillance, drug promotion, research and development, access to medications in developing countries, and physician prescribing behavior. Dr. Lexton has been a consultant on pharmaceutical care issues in Ontario and various arms of the Canadian federal government, the World Health Organization, government of New Zealand, and the Australian National Prescribing Service. And his most recent uh, research project, which runs from 2013 to 16, 
concerns the use of adverse drug event reporting in PharmaNet to improve patient safety and inform public policy. So obviously we have an extremely distinguished and knowledgeable speaker tonight. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Joel Lexton. Science and the Rotman Institute for inviting me here. Um, and just before I start, there are a, a couple of things. One is, and I have to say this because otherwise I might get fired, but it's York where I teach. Not um, and the other one is that I'm not sure I want to be the grandfather of anything at this point. I feel too young. So I'm going to as you can see there from the talk, or from the title, talk about um, what happens when power, in this case money, is concentrated um, in one institution, which in this case is the pharmaceutical industry. And just before I go into the slides, let me point out that this has relevance today. Anybody who looked at the Globe and Mail or saw an advanced, um, an online story that's, going to, that's in McLean's, will know um, about what's going on with Tamiflu and Relenza. These are two antiviral drugs. Canada has now spent $76 million stockpiling these things. There are 19 million either capsules or in one case in uh, there's one product is an inhalation. So we have this stored somewhere. Um, four or five years ago, a group of researchers started trying to figure out whether or not these drugs actually did work. Um, and at that point, they could get maybe one-tenth of the um, trials that had been done on them because all the rest were not being published by Roche the company that had funded them. Um, now that Roche, after four years, agreed to release the data, there's an article that came out today in the British Medical Journal that says that these drugs are largely a waste of time. If you take them, it'll cut down on your symptoms for about, by about half a day. Um, it doesn't prevent any complications. Um, so we may have not only wasted a whole bunch of money, but also been treating people um, with something that's useless. And remember, even if a drug doesn't work, it still has side effects. All right, so here's what we're gonna go through. Um, who funds clinical trials? Um, how the funding affects the results of clinical trials? Um, and then how, how they can be biased, and that's where the bulk of this talk is gonna be. So what, what are the ways that drug companies can use to bias the results of the trials that they fund? I'm gonna talk a bit about suppressing unwanted information, and then finally, what can be done about all this? So just to start, anybody know who um, Willie Sutton was? Thank you. Yes, there he is, bank robber in the 1930s. And there's a story, which may or may not be true, that when Willie Sutton was finally caught, some reporter came up to him and asked him, why do you rob banks? And what was Willie's answer? That's where the money is. So, if you want to know what goes on in clinical trials, you have to know where the money is. And so in the United States, you can see there that the money is not in the public sector by and large, the money is in the private sector. Most of the trials that are funded in the United States are funded by either the pharmaceutical companies or if it's biomedical devices by the biomedical companies 
or if it's biological products by the companies that make those. And same thing goes in Norway. Most of the trials that are funded there are funded by the companies. Canada, it's a little harder to get information. Um, so the best I could do when I looked last night was this. So CIHR spends about $33 million a year on randomized controlled trials. Now those are not necessarily um, just for drugs, they may be for other things. Um, and that compares to um, a lot more, um, $455 million that is spent by the drug companies on clinical trials. So the drug companies here are spending 15 times more than CIHR, which means that if you're in a clinical trial or if you're going to look at if clinical trials are being run, they're going to be paid for by the drug companies. Now, this wouldn't matter if the results were reliable, but the results aren't necessarily reliable. So a few years ago, I, along with um, some people in the US, um, another Canadian, and somebody from Denmark, did what's called a systematic review. We looked at all of the articles that have been published um, that examined the outcome of clinical trials by virtue of who had funded them. So it was either industry had funded them or anybody else. Um, no funding, government funding, hospital funding, foundations, charities, what have you. And that got published as this Cochrane Review. This came out um, about a year and a half ago. And what did we find um, from this? Well, we found that if you looked at the results of clinical trials, if it was published by the industry, if it was funded by the industry, the odds ratio of a positive result was 2.5. In other words, twice as, more than twice as likely to be positive. And if you were looking at the conclusions, because the results sometimes don't match the conclusions, um, it was two point, almost 2.7 times more likely to have positive conclusions um, if the industry funded it. So there is clearly um, something going on that means when the industry is funding a clinical trial that it ends up being in favor of the industry. Now people argue about various things that the industry does a better job of, fund, of designing the trials, um, that the industry, um, that the industry um, will only do trials when it thinks that it's going to be, they're going to be successful. And some people have looked at this um, as a line of argument. And what did they, here is just the title of one paper that sort of puts the lie to all of this. And if you read the title, what it says is if you compare two antipsychotic drugs, it depends on who publishes, who's funded the trial. So when you've got olanzapine and risperidone, if the maker of olanzapine funds the trial, olanzapine wins. If the maker of risperidone funds the trial, risperidone wins. Um, if you've got ketiapine versus olanzapine, and you get the idea. So it's not a question of trial design. It's a question of who is paying for the trial that makes the difference in the outcomes of these trials. So how does all this happen? What's the mechanism behind the biasing of clinical trials? And I'm going to go through a number of, um, a number of techniques that the drug companies will use. Okay, so first off is um, support um, who's paying and what is the, um, 
what is the research topic? And here, this is um, some results from a couple of surveys that were done in the United States between one in 1985 and one in 1995. And there's a more recent one that I haven't included. And you can see there that if you're being funded by industry, first of all, you're going to choose a topic which has commercial value. Industry is not interested in things where there is not an end product. So let's take um, sexually transmitted diseases amongst teenagers. Okay. If you want to test an antibiotic, you're likely going to be able to find funding from some company or other. Because if the trial proves to be positive, the industry can then use that positive trial to market its products. However, if you want to test, say, techniques to modify the sexual behavior of teenagers so that they don't transmit the diseases in the first place, well, there's no product associated with that. So chances are you will not find an industry sponsor. And today's world, um, where CIHR funds about 15% of the trials that are, or the projects that are submitted to it. Um, you know, if you can't get, chances are you won't get CIHR money and that leaves you with the drug industry. The industry, another example of how the industry um, funding biases what's done is here. So, Osteoarthritis of the knee, pretty common when you get old, like me. Um, and what kind of what kind of areas does industry fund? And you can see here that um, drug treatment for OA. All the other topics um, are not likely to be funded by the industry. Now this would be okay if that's what people actually wanted. But when you ask people who um, have some stake in osteoarthritis, what do they think should be funded, you get a much different answer. So if you ask rheumatologists, they think that non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, that's the typical um, drug used for osteoarthritis, these things have been over-researched. They don't want funding of drugs. If you ask patient focus groups, they want um, funding for things like physiotherapy. Um, and they want more research into education and self-help. If you ask GPs, they would like research into surgical treatment. And um, they think oral drugs have been over-researched. And if you ask physiotherapists, they think that physiotherapy needs more research into this. So nobody seems to want research into drugs, oral drugs for osteoarthritis, but as you see there, that's what gets funded because that's where the money is. So the in when industry funds trials, trials typically or always have what are called endpoints. In other words, what's the object of the trial and are you going to compare your drug against something else or are you going to compare it against placebo? So let's have a look here um, about this. This is a um, looking at the design of um, drugs or trials for a couple of um, pretty common conditions. One of them, um, hypertension, um, and one of them is heart failure. And you can see, so let's look here. Okay, this one here, and I'll explain what this means in a minute, and the Outcome. So the comparison in these is atenolol, amlodipine, atenolol, atenolol, 
and the is heart failure in the primary composite outcome? And the answer is no, yes, no, no. What does all this mean? Well, what it means is that the active group, the drug that's being tested in a couple of cases, are these things. These are calcium channel blockers. Calcium channel blockers are known to aggravate heart failure. So do you include heart failure in your, in your outcome? The answer is no. And the, um, the trials on atenolol have shown actually that there is no difference when you're looking at um, the outcomes. Atenolol doesn't seem for some reason to affect, um, to affect mortality in people with heart disease. So if you're testing your drug against atenolol, you're testing it against placebo, and you're virtually guaranteed that you're going to get a positive outcome. So you test it against the wrong drug, and you don't include the outcomes that may make your drug look poor, look bad. The other thing that drug company, or another thing that drug companies do, is they hide data. So those of you who remember, there used to be something called Viox. This was a, um, a supposed to be a new kind of anti-inflammatory. Um, the generic name was Rofecoxib, put out by Merck in 90, late 99, by just by the time it got pulled from the market in Canada and worldwide, it was the 10th most widely prescribed drug in this country. Um, so what did we find, what happened with some of the trials around rofecoxib? So Merck was not really just content to have this drug being used as a painkiller or an anti-inflammatory. It was looking at all sorts of other um, possible uses for it, one of which was Alzheimer's. So they had a trial going on Alzheimer's, and um, what did the trial show? There was a significant increase in those who were taking, in mortality, in those who were taking Vioxx versus placebo. <coughs> Merck didn't tell that to the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration in the United States, when it submitted the data. When the FDA raised <coughs> safety questions about um, Vioxx and in this trial, Merck replied that the um, findings were small numeric differences, most consistent with chance fluctuations, which was a lie. Here are the um, curves for this, and you can see that there is clearly a difference in um, the mortality. Placebo is much lower um, than with Vioxx. Okay, so not all when, you, when a company is doing trials on its product to get them approved for marketing, they have to submit all of the data that they have generated, all of the trials, to either in the States, the FDA, or here in Canada, to Health Canada, um, so that and these trials get reviewed by the appropriate regulatory authority, which then decides whether or not to approve the drug. But the data itself is owned by the companies, which means that the companies decide which trials get published. So this particular paper or that this figure comes from is from the United States, and it concerns um, all of the trials that were submitted to the FDA for um, a variety of antidepressants. And in total, there were, um, let's see, 24, 
3673 74 trials that were submitted to the MDA. 38 were positive, and out of those 38, 37 got published. 12 were questionable, 6 didn't get published, 6 got published, 24 were negative, 16 were never published, 3 were published as negative, and 5 were published as positive. And because the companies own this data, and the data is treated as commercially confidential, this, the FDA, or Health Canada, never tells anybody that when the trial gets published, it may contradict what they had actually, what they had seen. And here's just another slide from this, um, from this same study. So this looks, looks at something called effect size. In other words, how beneficial is a product? And these are all of the different um, antidepressants that have been examined. And what you can see there is all these lines go down. And what does that mean? It means the top part of the line is the effect size when it was submitted to the FDA. The bottom is the effect size when it was published in a journal. The effect size always got bigger when it, the trial was published in a journal. It never got smaller. And this hiding of clinical data has very serious consequences. There are Although the SSRI antidepressants, these are the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, Prozac, Paxil, etc., these antidepressants have never been approved for use in either children or adolescents. But they still get used because for a variety of reasons, in some cases, um, it takes a year, it's going to take a year to get a child seen by a pediatric psychiatrist. The kid is clearly disturbed. The doctor doesn't know what else to do, so they reach for the drug and they use it. So the question then came up, well, these things have never been approved for use in kids. Are they in fact effective and are they safe? So if you just looked at the published data for these antidepressants, SSRI antidepressants, what you would see is there was some evidence that they were useful, and there was no evidence that they were harmful. But it, when you were able to get hold of the unpublished data, the stuff that's sitting in somebody's drawer somewhere, then the conclusions became markedly different. So the conclusions were, there was no evidence of efficacy, and there was evidence of harm. So by hiding these trials, the FDA, or the drug companies, were leading to potential harm in children, and there was no benefit that these kids were getting. The next topic that I want to talk about is something called ghostwriting. And ghostwriting is the situation that occurs when the drug companies, who again own the data, hire a medical writing company to write up the results of a study. And if the drug company is paying for it to be written up, you can be pretty sure that it's going to reflect what they want the trial to say. And then what these people do is they go out or the companies go out and find a doctor or a scientist who is willing to put their name 
on the trial, on the study, when it gets, and so it'll get published under that person's name. Now, any of you who did that would get dinged for plagiarism and thrown out. Um, but this is actually a pretty common practice in journal writing. Nobody knows quite how common, but it occurs pretty frequently. So how frequently? So here is a, um, some information about one antidepressant. This is paroxetine. Um, and so this is the company that was paid to um, write the trials. And then there were trials on this drug that were not ghostwritten. Ghostwritten ones were about twice as many as the non-ghostwritten ones. The ghostwritten ones had a much higher profile in the literature because these are people who are paid to write. They write quite well. Um, and they also get cited a lot more. So at least for this particular drug, if you wanted to look at the literature, what you were going to see was ghostwritten articles. And the ghostwritten articles were going to give you a very distorted picture of what, the, um, of what this product looked like. And the same goes with Zoloft, another antidepressant. And here is, this comes out of court case documents that were disclosed. So here is the, um, what the trial was about. Here is the company that was doing the writing. Here is what the um, conclusions were going to be. And here is who the author was going to be, and what it says is author TBD, which is author to be determined. So they'd written up the articles, and now they were hunting for people who were going to um, who were going to sign them. Um, study three two nine which this slide refers to, is quite controversial. It was one of the studies around um, the use of antidepressants in children. Got published as a positive trial, but if you actually get the data, it was a negative trial. Um, but the, the other interesting parts are here. Um, they say that it showed trends in efficacy, but the second study failed to demonstrate any separation of um, Paxil from placebo, and therefore data from these two trials will not be submitted to the regulatory authorities because they weren't positive enough. And here is the reason why it would be commercially unacceptable to include a statement that efficacy had not been demonstrated as this would undermine the profile of paroxetine. <clears throat> so pretty clear that you get a negative result and if it's going to harm the commercial interests that you're not going to um, publish that, you're not going to let anybody know about it despite whatever harm might come from the people who are using the product. And even more so, even more on top of this, is the fact that at least some of the people who participated in this trial, some of the scientists, knew that this was the case, that these drugs didn't work, but couldn't say anything because they had signed non-disclosure agreements. So this is a psychiatrist, pediatric psychiatrist from Vancouver who at one point wrote um, about this in the Canadian Medical Association Journal and said that, you know, she was silenced um, because of this non-disclosure agreement. The other thing that happens 
in drug trials is they get stopped before they're finished. And they get stopped for a variety of reasons. One is the drug is looking really unsafe and it's not ethical to continue. The second is that the drug is looking really good and it's not ethical to keep giving people the comparator or the placebo. But the third reason, and the third reason is actually much more common than the first two, is because the commercial priorities of companies change. This is, this slide looks at six trials, not for trivial conditions, but for things like cancer, um, where the trials were stopped without, before they were completed. And what this means is that the data, you can never get any for good data out of these trials. You, never, you don't know, did this drug work? Did it work? Was it safe? Wasn't it safe? So not only are you hiding the data, what you're also doing is you're telling the people who participated in the trial, the patients, that your time was worthless. You enrolled in the trial, um, but we decided to cancel it, um, so too bad for you. You're not going to make any contribution to science. And the same with the researchers, you're telling them that their, um, their time was wasted. And I said that the, um, this is more common than the other two reasons. So if you look at um, data from the US, you can see that. So trials stopped for economic reasons. In other words, the drug isn't going to make as much money as they hoped, or the priorities of the company had changed and they were getting out of the area and didn't want to have a drug um, in that particular, for that particular disease. Much more common than stopping it for um, either that the drug didn't work or it was unsafe. Going back for a minute to, um, well, no, actually, conflict of interest is also an issue in determining what the results of a trial are going to be. So here we have um, a slide that looks at, was the trial positive, mixed, in other words, possibly beneficial, but possibly not, or negative. And this slide looks at the results of the trial and whether or not the people who are doing the trial had a conflict of interest. In other words, did they have, besides getting money from the um, company to, do, to run the trial, did they have some other kind of conflict? Were they on speakers bureaus for the company? Did they... Um, did they serve on advisory panels for the company? Did they do, um, did they own stock? And you can see there that it was much more likely that you were gonna report a positive finding if you um, had a conflict of interest. And if you didn't have a conflict, you were much more likely to report a negative result. And this just essentially says the same thing. So here is a collect, these uh, the people who did this study rated the, um, the conclusions of a tri drug trials on a scale of one to six. And one essentially means, who knows, maybe it works, maybe it doesn't work, do more research. And six is, this is the next best, this is the best thing since sliced bread. And again, who funded the trial? It was funded by a for-profit organization, much more likely to report a very strong conclusion. And if you had, was funded by 
either for-profit or not-for-profit organizations, but not commercial interests, much more likely to be equivocal. One of the other drugs that was competing with Vioxx was Celebrex. Um, and Celebrex um, came out about the same time, and there was this big trial that was published in the Journal of the American Medical Association, one of the leading um, journals in the world, general medical journals in the world. And this slide would seem to, Vioxx and Celebrex were both being marketed um, on the grounds that they were much less likely to cause bleeding in, of the, in the stomach. All of the um, drugs like ibuprofen or naproxen carry a risk of stomach bleeding. Vioxx mm -hmm. and Celebrex were being marketed as having a much less likely chance of doing that. And from here, it looks like this is actually true. So the, um, the black is the bleeding rate if you were taking one of the standard non-steroidals, and the gray is if you were taking Celebrex. And it looks like this was um, the case, that they were preventing stomach bleeding. However, what turned out was this was six-month data. The trials actually went for a year. At the year end, there was no difference in bleeding in the stomach from Celebrex versus the others, but that data was never, bought, was never published. If you have trouble getting your articles into medical journals, um, then the solution is that you should find a medical publishing company, in this case Elsevier, the, I think it's the largest medical publishing company in the world, and you should get them to help you create journals. So that's what Merck did. So here is the um, Australian, Australian Asian Journal of Bone and Joint Medicine which lasted for about a year, was a purely commercial creation, um, only ran articles by Merck, but was marketed as a real medical journal. Okay, seeding trials. Once a drug comes on the market, the drug companies want to get as many doctors to use it as possible. This is their window to recover um, their money that they've spent. And um, what the, uh, what's what pretty well known is that once doctors start prescribing a, a drug, they will often continue to use it. So you run what are called seeding trials. Seeding trials are, have no scientific value, what they, but all they're designed to do is to get doctors to start taking, start prescribing the drug um, with the knowledge that they'll continue to do so. So this is just a quote from a, um, an executive at a contract research organization. Contract research organizations are companies that are hired by the drug companies now to actually run the trials for them. So here is what this particular executive had to say. We have been approached by several pharmaceutical manufacturers to conduct seed studies. These studies are usually intended to increase the use of the manufacturer's product and sometimes lack scientific integrity. The intent is to influence physician and patient behavior. So a clear admission of what the nature of, these of this, this kind of trial is. And one of these trials 
was something called Advantage, which looks at the comparison in stomach and GI tolerability, in other words, stomach bleeding between Vioxx and Naproxen, paid for by Merck. And here is a quote from this, um, the from um, an investigation into this trial. The trial was designed by Merck's marketing division to fulfill a marketing objective. Merck's marketing division handled both the scientific and the marketing data, including the collection, analysis, and dissemination. And Merck hid the marketing nature of the trial from participants, physician investigators, and institutional review board members. <coughs> These kinds of trials are not uncommon. Um, they the estimates are that maybe 5% of the trials that are out there are seeding trials, and this just shows you that seeding trials actually work in terms of um, changing prescribing behavior. So if you were in a practice that was part of a seeding trial for a particular drug, one particular asthma drug, when you started the trial, um, this was the percentage of time that you were prescribing the product. These were the people who were not in a trial for this product, same numbers. But by the end of two years, the percentage of prescribing had gone up significantly, whereas if you weren't in the seeding trial, nothing happened. Okay. The um, drug companies finally <clears throat> try, if the results of something are going to be, are not looking good, they will try and suppress the data. And they do that in a number of ways. So, one of them is to prevent publication. So, oops, okay, Betty Dong, Synthroid, and Flint Laboratories. So Betty Dong was a researcher at the <laughs> University of California who had done some work on thyroid, different, kind, different brands of thyroid medications. And she had, the work that she had published um, prior to being hired by Flint, had shown that the, um, that the product, that the brand name version was maybe better than the generic version. And that's what Flint wanted to show, because um, if the generic versions were the same, acted the same, then they were gonna lose a lot of market share, because generics are cheaper. So they hired Betty Dong, approved her research design, and then at the end of her research, she had shown that, in fact, all the products, generic brand, were the same. Now around this time, Flint was arranging um, to be taken over by a larger company. The shareholder value of Flint would have dropped dramatically had this result become known. So Betty Dong had made the unfortunate mistake of signing a non-disclosure agreement. And Flint went to her and said, you publish, we will sue you. The University of California wouldn't back her up. The article had already been accepted um, by JAMA, Journal of the American Medical Association, but faced with the prospect of being sued, she withdrew the article. And it would have remained withdrawn had somehow the Wall Street Journal not gotten hold of this and put it on their front page, after which Flint seemed to back down and allow the article to be published. Companies will also try and neutralize experts. So, <clears throat> those of you who um, remember 
there were a group, a couple of drugs out there that were being marketed quite aggressively for um, weight loss. One of them was um, Pondemon, and I can't remember what the name of the other one was. Um, these drugs, however, proved not only to be ineffective, largely, but to have very serious side effects. So they either caught, they could cause one of two things, something called pulmonary hypertension, which means that the vessels in your lungs get narrowed and you can't push the blood through your lungs. Um, this is typically a fatal disease, or they cause problems with your heart valves. This was being publicized by some doctors, um, but here, and this is what the, um, the company that made these products, Wyeth, had to say. It would be a good idea for you, meaning the medical affairs director, and Dr. Fache, who was an epidemiologist formerly with the FDA, um, now with the company, to prepare several plans of action that would neutralize these gentlemen, the doctors in Montreal, who were making the point that these drugs could kill people, without appearing aggressive towards them. Which wasn't always, in fact, what they did. They sometimes were much more aggressive. So, um, Merck, again, back to Vioxx. Um, this doctor was giving talks that were negative about Vioxx, and if this, the anti-Vioxx talks continued, Dr. Singh would flame out, and there would be consequences for Stanford. Stanford was the university where he's employed at. Um, again, Merck. So a drug bulletin in Spain um, published an article that highlighted the methodological flaws in two of the trials around these um, non around either um, Celebrex, that's the class trial, or Vigo, that's the Viox trial. Um, and these are just some of the things that these that were in this um, article in the bulletin. Merck's response was they demanded that the bulletin retract the article and publish a text written by Merck. The bulletin refused, <laughs> and Merck sued the bulletin and its editor, and the case got thrown out of the court. Now, some of you probably know about Nancy Oliveri and her battles with Apotex, which are still going on. In fact, she's due in court um, in the next few weeks around all this. But there is another case that's less well known that involves Ann Holbrook at McMaster. Ann is a, um, a general internist um, and also a pharmacoepidemiologist. Got hired by the Ontario government a number of years ago to write a set of guidelines for the use of um, GI medications, so medications that affected the gastrointestinal system. And one of those groups of drugs were the group called the PPIs, the proton pump inhibitors. This is um, Nexium um, and that group of drugs, the purple pills. Um, that have been marketed heavily on American TV. What Ann Holbrook was going to say in the guidelines was that all of the various PPIs were the same. There was no difference in them, in either in how well they work or how, um, how safe mm -hmm. they were. When AstraZeneca found out about this, they sent her a letter saying that not just that they were going to sue the Ontario government, which had hired her, but they were going to sue her personally. Now, this hit the front page of the Globe and Mail, and quite soon afterwards, AstraZeneca apologized, saying that it was all a mistake. 
Well, possibly, <laughs> um, but probably not. And even if they hadn't gone through with the lawsuit, um, this just sends a message to anybody else who's going to publish similar uh, material that they should be wary of what might happen to them. And in fact, um, this did happen with um, CADA, Canadian Agency for Drugs and Technology and Health, when it was known by its former name, CODA, Canadian Coordinating Organization for Health Technology Assessment, they released a set of guidelines around a different group of drugs, got sued, and it tied, tied them up for a whole year in court before the case was finally thrown out. Okay, so what does all this mean? Well, Alan Maynard, who is a British um, health economist, summed it up quite nicely. And what he said was, economic theory predicts that firms will invest in corruption of the evidence base where the benefits exceed its costs. Investment in biasing the evidence base, both clinical and economic and pharmaceuticals, is likely to be detailed and comprehensive, covering all aspects of the appraisal process. In other words, if it's worth your while, you'll do it. And the evidence is that in spite of massive fines levied in the United States, by the way, in Canada, we have never fined drug companies for illegal promotion. It works. You can be fined, look at these fines, 1.4 billion, 430 million, 2.3 billion, but look at how much money they made. So this is like lunch money. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if we pay 1.4 billion, we make 36 billion. So fines are not going to work. At least not the level of fines that we currently have. What about jail? <laughs> As my wife will tell you, jail is one option that I have. I also advocate summary execution, but that's probably not going to be acceptable. Um, okay, jail. Well, back in the early 1980s, there was an Australian um, criminologist who, for his PhD, did work on what, or did a book called Corporate Crime in the Pharmaceutical Industry. And for this book, he went around and he interviewed people, um, including executives in the drug companies. And what he found was very interesting. At least two companies in the United States had a position which was effectively called vice president in charge of going to jail. So should the company ever be convicted in criminal court and somebody from the company had to go to jail, that was what this person was hired to do. Take the blame, stand up, say guilty, and go to jail. So jail may not be good enough either. What we need, in fact, it's money that biases this. Remember Willie Sutton. So you need to create a firewall between the money and the trials. And you can do one of two things. You can have the money, the companies can still fund the trials, and they would turn over the money to a third party, like CIHR, or the NIH in the United States, and then the NIH or CIHR would choose who to, should conduct the trial. Um, those people would independently analyze the data, the data would be made publicly available, and the companies, besides paying for the trial, would have nothing more to do with it. So they wouldn't be able to decide what the comparator agent was, they wouldn't be able to look to decide what the endpoints were, 
um, they would just be the funders. Or you could go one step further and you could go to public funding of clinical trials. And if you did public funding of clinical trials, not only do you remove the drug companies from this equation, but what you also do is determine what products are going to be um, tested in the first place. Under this system, you don't have the choice. You're still relying on the companies to decide what they want to choose, what they want to test. Under here, they lose on that. Now, the companies would still make money because what you would do is you would pay them once the product, once they develop the product, you would pay them an amount of money for having developed it. <clears throat> the public would fund the trials, the drug was approved, the drug would then be, um, you would have non-exclusive licenses, so you would have multiple companies making the product if it looked like it was going to be um, commercially successful. Generic, that's the equivalent of generic competition, lowers the prices, and so the money you save from, um, from lower prices would be able to go into public funding. So that's what we need to do. If we're worried about the biases that result from the funding of clinical trials by commercial entities, and commercial entities are the ones um, that currently fund about 80% of all the clinical trials, um, then we need to move away from that system whereby <clears throat> the funder controls the data. Um, otherwise, what we're setting ourselves up for are more situations like Vioxx, like the SSRIs, where we are marketing products that um, without a true knowledge of how well they work, or how safe they are, and just think about Tamiflu, um, which we have $75 million worth of pills somewhere in a warehouse somewhere. Anybody who wants to read more about this, here's just a short bibliography. So thank you very much. Thanks very much. Sorry about your presentation. Sorry. Right. Because uh, the devices at the end are changes. Uh, how do you think one ought to go about trying to get such things in place? Okay, so. <clears throat> can you repeat the question? Sure. How can you. Um, actualize these um, changes that I was talking about. So there are a variety of groups mm -hmm. out there that are pushing, so far not terribly successfully, for, um, for these things to come into reality. So the, um, there's a group um, with one of the people is at Calgary, um, Aiden Hollis, that that project is called HIF, the Health Impact Fund, and they are looking at a prize model. So there would be a pool of money set aside um, for, and it would be given to um, products that were um, that were success, that were medical advances. So this is a way of pushing companies not to find drugs that are the most commercially successful, in other words, something that will grow hair um, or that will remove toenail fungus, but that actually have significant therapeutic value. There are other prize fund models that are out there. There is um, There are people looking at what's called an R&D treaty, whereby countries would sign on to give a small, very small part of their GDP, like 0.02% into a fund which would then pay for research into drugs. Um, there are currently ongoing product development partnerships which are a combination of commercial and non-commercial entities. 
um, doing research into drugs for neglected diseases, which have no um, have no commercial value, so the drug companies aren't interested in them. So there are a lot of models that are being proposed, um, but it's pretty hard to get um, to get traction with these because <clears throat> the countries that have the or the regions that have the most potential to change also are the ones where the drug companies um, have a significant contribution to their economies. So the United States, um, the European Union, those are the two big players. And in both cases, the drug companies are pretty powerful. And they're not all that interested in changing this model. That's what's made them so successful. We're going to have a microphone go around to people in the audience who are asking questions. And uh, here is next. Thank you. Thank you. That's a very interesting talk. Um, so, am I right in thinking that at least in Canada there has been a kind of a, a, a movement to at least make available the fact that trials have taken place, publicly available, um, so that if, say, a firm performs nine clinical trials and only publishes one of them, that people are going to be in a position to ask, well, why haven't you published the other eight? And if that's the case, do you think that that would be effective? Given that, as I understand it, I don't know what the justification can be given for this, but the actual outcomes of the trials um, need to be made public. Okay, so the, what you're talking about is a clinical registry, which has been in existence in the United States since, oh, about 2006, 2005, it's clinicaltrials.gov, and initially what you had to do was you had to um, post a, ser a, a series of information um, about the trial, so who was doing it, what was its main outcome, was it recruiting patients, what company was paying for it, and a few other things. Um, now, clinicaltrials.gov has been expanded, and companies have to report at least some of the results from those trials. In 2005, I was at a meeting with Health Canada where they started talking about this, and currently they are still talking about it. So Health Canada has a registry that, um, but all the registry is designed to do is to let patients know what trials may be recruiting, and so you can if you've got pick a disease and you want to know whether or not there's a trial for your disease, you can go to the website and try and find and see whether or not there is a trial and then see about enrolling. So Health Canada has done extremely little in the way of clinical trial registries. Can I just add a footnote to that? There was an article of maybe within the last year or so about the journals that were requiring this, like JAMA in New England, and they were breaking their own rules. Yes. They, weren't, they weren't even enforcing the pre-registration of these trials in about half the publications that they were doing. Yes, there's a, a group of medical editors called the International Committee on medical, of Medical Journal Editors. So this is 13 of the highest profile medical journals in the world. Back in 2005, they said, if you want to get a your article published in our journal, you have to have registered it with clinicaltrials.gov. And around 2011, I think, there was an article that came out that showed that about a third of the trials that were published in these journals had not, in fact, been registered. <coughs> More questions in the um, back there. comment on uh, how much a regulatory capture there is in the system uh, are the FDA and other regulators uh, heavily influenced by the industry okay so there is back and forth between 
the, um, the regulators and the industry. People move one way or the other. Typically, they move out of government into industry. <clears throat> and this may have some effect, but what's more, um, pers what's, what causes more problems <clears throat> is the fact that over the past couple of decades, mm, <coughs> sorry, regulatory bodies have started to rely for part or all of their funding on what are called, what's called cost recovery or user fees. So you want to get a drug approved in Canada, well you need to give Health Canada I think it's currently $350,000 when you submit your documentation. <clears throat> and right now, this in Canada, the user fees amount to 50% of all of the funding for the drug regulatory act, um, the drug regulatory activities of Health Canada. <coughs> and in the, <coughs> Excuse me. In the United States, it's about the same with the FDA. In other places, it's even more. Um, but what the industry has asked for in return for mm -hmm. paying money is in the United States explicitly that regulatory authorities need to meet deadlines or timelines for reviewing a, an application they have to meet those timelines 90% of the time. And if the FDA doesn't do that, then when these user fees come up for renegotiation, they may, in fact, get lowered. Here in Canada, we have also, in the past two years, done essentially the same thing. So what we have said that is if Health Canada, on average, takes <coughs> more than um, goes over its deadline by more than 10% in one year, then the user fees are going to be reduced by 10% the next year, and if you go over by 20%, then you're going to have the fees reduced by 20% the following year. Somebody in the U.S. took a look at what the effects are of trying to meet the deadlines. And so what they did was they looked at drugs that were approved, within two months of the deadline versus all the other drugs, either ones that were approved um, before two months um, of the deadline or after the deadline, because once you've gone over, it doesn't matter. And what they found was that the drugs that were approved within two months of the deadline, in other words, you're getting close and you're starting to panic, those drugs were about five times more likely to have a serious safety warning issued about them once they got on the market. So yes, there is possibly some regulatory capture, but it's this pervasive or, um, influence of the user fees which is much more concerning because now that the money, the money used to come from one source, the public in the form of tax dollars, now that the money is coming from two sources, um, there are two masters that the regulatory agency needs to serve. One is the public, and the second is the industry. And it seems that in order to serve the industry, they're willing to make mistakes. Um, right in the back, all the way. Well, first off, thank you for the, that talk. It was equal parts uh, interesting and depressing. Uh, my question actually is, uh, in terms of medical specialties, um, what group or what group of patients would you expect to be most subject to this kind of this kind of uh, drugs that are developed in this kind of research? I mean, who among the medical specialties, where is this most concentrated? Okay, so I mean, typically you're dealing with groups of where drugs are most heavily used. So one of them is psychiatry. Um, there have been a number of scandals in the US about relationships between um, very prominent psychiatrists and, um, and drug companies. Um, others are cardiologists. Drugs are heavily used. 
in cardiology, respirology. Um, so those would be some of the groups where you're um, where you're going to find the most kind, the most evidence of conflicts of interest. Um, in fact, in psychiatry, if you look at um, the creation of the DSM, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, um, the current version, which is DSM-5, DSM is put together by a variety of committees on each different area. There are about 20 committees that um, get together. And if you look at the conflicts of interest in the amongst these committees, um, they range, one of them has zero conflicts, um, a number of them have, 100% of the people have conflicts, right. and most of them have 50% or more of the members have a conflict of interest with, um, um, in, the, in the creation of the guidelines. So psychiatry would be um, probably my number one choice for who's guilty. Uh, Emily had a question. Um, I have a question from live online, a quick one from a student watching online. Um, and correct me if you've answered this slightly before. Um, how do we procure unpublished data and ghostwriting statistics exactly? Okay, so the main way, well, ghostwriting typically comes out through court cases in the United States. Documents, under some circumstances, um, documents that are filed in court um, will be released. Um, and then there is a repository that's been created at the University of California, um, San Francisco campus, that has taken whatever documents have been released and um, put them up online with a search function so that you can look for what's going on. This is the Drug Industry Data Archives, um, or DITA. Um, so that's where ghostwriting comes out. The results of the unpublished trials, you can get that, not in Canada, but you can get that some of that information in the United States because what the United States will publish are um, the re they don't publish the trial data, but they publish the reviewers' reports about the trials. Once the, they redact them to remove commercially sensitive information, but they publish these things so you can see what trials have been done, and then you can go look and see whether or not these trials have been published um, in medical journals. So you can't do that in Canada. You're going to be able to start doing that in Europe because the European Medicines Agency has said um, that it will release all of the clinical data that was submitted to it um, when a drug gets approved. Again, after any sensitive information about um, manufacturing secrets or patient identifiers have been removed. In the I want you to comment on the prescription of statins, because that has been the highly prescribed medicine, and I believe that last use of last 20 years hasn't really decreased the uh, incidence of CHDs. Okay, so statins in my view, have some value if you, in men who have coronary artery disease. So if you've had a heart attack or if, you're, if you've got very poor coronary arteries, statins have some value. Um, if you're a woman, so far they have no value in primary prevention, in other words, stopping you from getting heart disease, or in secondary prevention, if you have heart disease. They don't seem to stop its progression. 
For men, there may be a depending on your other risk factors, there may be a small benefit for primary prevention. So statins are useful under some circumstances, but I also think that they're widely overprescribed. Okay, so um, being a physician yourself, I'm wondering if you could make a comment about um, the medical community's current level of trust or skepticism um, with the pharmaceutical industry. Um, so things have changed somewhat <clears throat> since I've been doing all this, um, but the change, <clears throat> if you look at it, <clears throat> excuse me, um, doctors are now willing to recognize that the drug companies will influence physicians. But there's a big caveat here. So if you ask <clears throat> doctors, which they have done, do you think that you personally will be in influenced by drug companies, and you break it down into a lot, a little, and none at all, what you find is 1% say a lot, I will be influenced a lot. About a third say I might be influenced a little, and the rest, two thirds say I won't be influenced at all. But if you ask them about their colleagues, <laughs> who may not be as trustworthy, then what you end up with is about 20% say a lot, and about 50% say some, and only 30% say not at all. So doctors recognize that others may be influenced, but they don't recognize that they themselves can be influenced. There is an incredible naivety amongst doctors that we think that we can go for the dinners and take the trips and um, take the gifts well, their gifts in Canada are now somewhat limited. You can only take gifts if they have a medical value, so you can take a $100 book um, because that has medical value. But we're naive in thinking that we can do all this and um, remain uninfluenced. There's, this is all related to something called the gift relationship. And the gift relationship is simply um, come Christmas, you get a card from somebody who you didn't send one to because you didn't think they were worthwhile. Well, next year you're probably going to send them one because they did you a favor, they sent you a gift, and now you feel that you need to repay them. And that's what the drug companies rely on, is that they have given you a gift, and you're in some way going to repay them. You're going to talk to their sales reps um, or do something else that's going to be beneficial to them. The drug companies currently spend, well in the United States, um, somewhere in the range of 50 billion, that's with a B, 50 billion dollars a year um, marketing their products to doctors. Here in Canada it's probably between two and a half and four billion and the drug companies are run by very smart people and they wouldn't be spending all this money if they didn't think they were going to get a return for it. And they don't allow their own employees to take gifts. Right. Um, so, I know a little bit about Lisa Barron's work with the tobacco industry. Yes. And that got me thinking, and I'm wondering, oh. um, has, do you think the pharmaceutical industry has learned from what happened with the tobacco industry? Um, well, actually, Lisa Barrow is the one who created the Drug Industry Data Archives. Um, and have they learned? Um, well, you keep hearing every time that there's a billion dollar or two billion dollar fine, the drug companies say, oh, but that was five years ago and we've changed. Except that they keep saying that. Um, so, and, the Neurontin settlement, which is in 2004, that was Pfizer, 
and Pfizer said never again. But in 2010, Pfizer was fined over a billion dollars um, because they did it again. So I don't think that the drug companies are going, they may be smarter at hiding it, but I don't think that they have actually changed. Um, you know, I've been in this, doing this kind of work for 30 years, and you talk to every time you say, this, there's a problem with this, there's a problem with that, and the answer is, that was then, now is different, but it's not. By the way, Lisa Barrow is also moving to Australia. Okay, one more question. You've talked about the relationship of trust that exists currently between the medical profession and the pharmaceutical industry. But you haven't talked about mm -hmm. perhaps the consumer's relationship with his or her own physician in light of the kinds of information that you're sharing with us. Well, again, this is, um, when you talk to patients in general, they may voice some discomfort with the um, medical profession, but when you talk to people about their individual doctor, by and large, people are very trusting of their own doctor for obvious reasons. If you're sick, and you're going to a doctor, you essentially are putting your faith in the fact that that doctor knows what they're doing, is going to correctly diagnose you, and is um, going to prescribe the appropriate medication for you. And if you're not, if you're losing that trust, and that's one of the reasons why people um, are saying that doctors need to break their relationship with the drug companies is because sooner or later there is going to be so much distrust of the general public for doctors that that's going to spill over into um, not believing what doctors are telling them. So at this point I think that there's still a pretty high level of trust between an individual patient and her or his individual doctor. And is that trust warranted? You know, doctors try, doctors try and do the best job that they can, um, but doctors are being deceived um, by the drug companies. The drug companies, if you see sales reps, those sales reps are only going to tell you about the positive things, and based on a study that, we that I was part of that was recently published, Sales reps only are going to disclose serious safety information about one in 20 times. So you're not going to hear about significant problems with drugs from sales reps. Um, if you take samples of new drugs, you're going to be giving your patients more expensive products. And because these things are new, you're going to be giving them products for which the safety information is less well known. Um, because when mm. drugs are being tested in clinical trials, they're only being tested in relatively homogeneous populations, typically middle-aged or younger adults, um, clear clear-cut diagnoses, not taking any other drugs, no other medical problems, but when a drug hits the market, it's going to be prescribed to an 85-year-old grandmother who's already on five other drugs, or possibly an eight-year-old kid, how's the drug going to work? So you take samples, you give those to these people, and again, you're gambling. Um, but, you know, doctors um, are only human, despite what some of us may think, um, and going to make mistakes. Um, but I think that, in by and large, they try and do what's best for their patients. But sometimes, they're, as I said, they're being deceived by by the information that they um, can get. Um, Dr. Lechen, thanks extraordinarily much for that wonderful presentation. Thank and, you. Um, uh, I, 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 <laughs> the drug companies have an act good antiviral. I might be more generous towards them. <laughs> Let's uh, give them a big round of applause.